Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we thought we'd approach the holidays from a way that all of us seem to get carte blanche, especially when it comes to a holiday such as Thanksgiving. And that is that of binge eating. We load the table up and we feel that we want to get through every bit and course there is to taste all the savers that are there right in front of us. However, for a lot of us, we try to see if we could set records, whether they're personal, family, or even world records when it comes to eating. Binge eating, though, on the other hand, when it comes to doing it on a regular basis, can actually have some fairly devastating side effects. And after all, overeating causes such things as weight loss and eventually things such as sickness, disease, and perhaps even death. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is just such a guest who had spent many decades researching the nature of binging and overeating, being worked with his own patients and a self-funded research program which had more than 40,000 participants. Frustrated by the psychology that was traditionally approaching things such as overweight and or food-obsessed individuals, he began his own way of being able to help people come to understand binge eating by offering methods of reprogramming people to think, like a permanently thin person. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest and author of the book, Never Binge Again, Mr. Glenn Livingston. Glenn, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Now, you really had a pretty rough time yourself, so let's talk about uh, binge and, and how it was and how it affected you. Oh, well, that's true. I'm not just a psychologist that decided to work with um, people with eating disorders. As a matter of fact, I avoided them for most of my life because I had such a serious problem myself, I would refer them out. Um, when I was about 17, because I'm 6'4 and I'm fairly muscular, I figured out that if I worked out for two or three hours a day, that I could eat whatever I wanted to. Um, you know, 6,000 calories a day, 7,000 calories a day, um, boxes of pizza, boxes of muffins, boxes of munchkins, chocolate bars, whatever, whatever wasn't nailed down, I was pretty much eating it. And if you, if you stopped at a 7-Eleven and they were out of Pop-Tarts, it was probably my fault. And that didn't really seem like a problem to me at the time. It seemed like a great thing, just like a fun way to enjoy life. Um, I now know that I was spending an awful lot of time eating and digesting and exercising that I could have been using to accomplish other things, but it didn't seem like a problem at the time. When I got older, and I was 22 or 23, and I was married, and I had responsibilities, and I was commuting two hours a day each way to work, and my wife wanted to talk to me, and... Um, you know, I just didn't have a time to work out like that. But I found that the food had a life of its own, and I couldn't, um, I couldn't stop. I just kept eating the same way, even though I wasn't working out. And as a consequence, I got fatter, slowly at first, and then a little faster. And my triglycerides went way up. They were over 1,000 at one point, and the doctors were telling me I was going to die by the time I was 30 if I didn't figure out how to get this under control. Um, and, and the worst part was that when I was sitting with patients, I found that I couldn't be a hundred percent present. And it's always been first and foremost, my goal in life to be an excellent psychologist. I was born in a family of 17 psychotherapists and, you know, if something breaks in the house, um, everybody knows how to ask it, how it feels and nobody knows how to fix it. But uh, all jokes aside, it was exceptionally important to me, and I was working with suicidal people, and I was working with couples right after an affair, and I found I couldn't be 100% present. And that really, really bothered me, because I'd you know, be thinking about when's the next time I can get to the deli. Um, coming from the family that I came from, I figured that it must be a psychological issue. Probably I'm trying to fill a hole in my heart. And if I could figure out how to fill that hole in my heart, then I wouldn't have to fill the hole in my stomach. And so I went to psychologists and psychiatrists and Overeaters Anonymous and saw some of the best people in the world. And as you could imagine, I knew them because of the family I was in. 
and, and we were in and around New York City where some of the best people live and work. Um, and it was a very soulful journey. I learned a lot about myself. Um, I, I don't regret it in any way, but at no point did I really figure out how to stop binging. I would get a little thinner and then a lot heavier and a little thinner and a lot heavier. And after a number of years, there were a couple of other things going on. I came to the conclusion that I had the wrong paradigm. That rather than trying to love myself thin, I would need to take control like an alpha wolf. That there is this bodily organ in me. I, I later learned that it was my reptilian brain, so the seat of feast and famine, um, fight or flight, survival impulses. And that I needed to take control of them in the same way that I took control of my bladder or my testicles. What I mean by that is there are perfectly valid biological drives, like the drive to urinate, which can press for expression at any time, but which we take control of because we want to act like civilized human beings. And I said, okay, I'm going to have to learn how to do this. And this is, this is like an alpha wolf dealing with a challenger for leadership. This is not like... Um, you know, filling a hole in your heart. And when an alpha wolf is challenged for leadership, it doesn't say, oh my goodness, someone needs a hug. It says, get back in line or I'll kill you, right? And it crawls and it snarls. And there are a couple of things very specifically that changed my mind about all this. One was I was um, simultaneous with my clinical practice. I was consulting for industry. I was doing a lot of work for big food and big pharma, and I kind of regret that now, but I was young and youth is wasted on the young, but I was, I felt like I was on the wrong side of the war. Um, and a lot of the work I did for big food, I saw that they were engineering, they're putting like billions of dollars into engineering these hyper palatable concentrations of starch and sugar and fat and oil and excitotoxins. It's so really these um, food-like substances that are intended to hit our bliss point without giving us enough nutrition to feel satisfied. And I said, well, that's a very powerful outside force, which has nothing to do with whether my mama loved me enough or whether I have the right marriage or, you know, am I really feeling love? That's, that's just a powerful outside force. They're, they're trying to break my hunger and phone meters to get me to have more of their stuff. And then I saw the advertising industry and they were, trying to get me to believe that this stuff was good for me, that I actually needed it to survive. And if you think that um, advertising doesn't affect you, and most people do think that, you really need to think again because advertising affects you more when your sales resistance is down. So if you think advertising doesn't mean anything, then you're really on the wrong track. Um, and I've, I've seen the studies. And it does mean something. And I, I saw that... Um, well, here's an example. I was, I was working with a major food bar manufacturer, and the VP, who was a friend of mine, pulled me aside and said, I've got to tell you something, Glenn. The reason this is so profitable is because we had an insight about a year ago, and we, we took the vitamins out of the bar because they were making it taste bad and they were expensive. And we put that money into the packaging instead, and we made the packaging look vibrant and colorful and healthy. And I said, so you're telling me that rather than making the bar be healthy, you made it look healthy. And he kind of hangs his head and he goes, yeah. And he, he was about to leave that, that company. Um, and I don't mean to single out that food bar manufacturer. That kind of thing goes on all across the industry. I could give you example after example. So, you know, you, you have these overwhelming forces aligned against us. Um, you have the addiction treatment industry, which tells you that you can't, you can't control yourself even if you wanted to. The best way, you, the best thing you can do is to abstain one day at a time because you're, if you're really an overeater, you're suffering from a chronic, mysterious, progressive disease, and there's, there's no evidence of that. Um, so there, there, there are these overwhelming forces which make it almost impossible for anybody to eat well. I mean, almost everybody overeats beyond their best judgment at some point. And then I also did this study. I... You know, I was getting paid to do these big studies, so I know how to do them relatively inexpensively. And in the days when Internet clicks were cheap, I just ran a survey for several years. So I got 40,000 people to tell me how, how stressed they were in 
different parts of life, what parts of life are they feeling stressed with, and what foods they were having difficulty controlling once they started. And I found some interesting patterns. People who struggled with chocolate, and I was someone who always started my binges on chocolate. I ate all kinds of other things, but it always started with chocolate, you know, just one bite, that kind of thing. And people who struggled with chocolate, they they tended to be lonely or brokenhearted or depressed. People who struggled with salty, crunchy things like chips or pretzels, they, they tended to be stressed at work. And people who struggled with soft, chewy things like um, bread and bagels and pasta, they, they tended to be stressed at home. And I thought that was really insightful and I was kind of on the way to figuring things out. And before I... Before I did anything about that publicly, I wanted to figure it out for myself. So I, I talked to my mom, who is not only a therapist herself, but she raised me. And I said, Mom, what do you think it is? Like, I, I rent the chocolate whenever I'm feeling lonely or brokenhearted. And it just seems this rings very true. How did that pattern get set up in my life? And my mom gets this horrible sound in her voice. And she says, I'm so sorry, Glenn. And I said, Mom, it's, it's okay. Whatever it is, it's 40 years ago. You know, I love you. I forgive you. I'm just trying to figure this out. And she goes, I'm so sorry. But, you know, when you were one year old in 1965, your dad was a captain in the Army, and they were talking about sending him to Vietnam, and I was terrified. And at the same time, your grandfather, my dad, had just gotten out of prison, and I had idolized that man. And I didn't know he was guilty. I didn't know he was doing these things. And my whole world came apart. And you know, we were trying to get pregnant with, with your sister. And I was afraid that I was going to be a, you know, an army widow with two small kids. And it just sounded like a horrible life. And, and she said, so what I did is I didn't have the wherewithal to hug you and love you and feed you when you came running to me um, when you were that little. So I got a big bottle of chocolate Bosco syrup and I put it in a refrigerator on the floor. And I would say, Glenn, go get your Bosco. And you'd go crawling over to the refrigerator. You'd open it up. You'd take out the chocolate Bosco syrup and you'd suck on the, on the bottle. And you'd go into a chocolate sugar coma. And I thought, oh, my God, well, that's, you know, that's where it all started. That's how it happened. And... You know, if this were a movie, if this were, if this were a fairy tale, then at that point, I would never have trouble with chocolate again. Mom and I would have a big hug and a big cry, and we'd forgive each other, and we would never have trouble with chocolate again. Um, you know, and we did have a hug, and, and, you know, of course, I forgive her, and I could forgive myself. It made me a little softer. But I actually found I ate more chocolate after that. And here's the weird reason. It's like there was this voice in my head that said, you know what, Glenn, you're right. Our mama didn't love us enough, and she left a great big chocolate-sized hole in her heart. And until you can find the love of your life and get out of this bad marriage, you're going to have to keep on binging. Yippee, let's go get some more chocolate now. And it, it was a voice of justification, and I realized that voice would use anything as a reason to binge. And then I thought, well, if you think about... If you think about a fire, let's say your emotions are a fire. If you think about a fire in a well-contained fireplace in a living room, that can become the center of hearth and home, right? I mean, people gather around it, they share stories, they make memories, and it becomes the center of living. It's only when the fireplace is not well-contained, if there are holes in the fireplace, that even one ash can get out, and if even one ember gets out, it can burn down the house. And I realized that it was this voice of justification more so than the emotion itself that needed fixing. And that from that point on, it started to seem clear to me that it was easier to address, to hear, address, and uh, either ignore or disempower that voice of justification. And I started paying really clear attention to what it would say, like, um, you worked out hard enough today. You're not going to get any way to eat chocolate. Um, you, you can always start tomorrow. You know, it's no big deal to be the same thing to start tomorrow. 
And it turns out that's not true, by the way, because the way our brains work, if you reinforce the pattern today, it's going to be harder to start tomorrow. So if you're in a hole, you need to stop digging. Um, and, and I would pay really careful attention, and eventually I, I embodied that voice. I, I had read some other work in addiction, and there were people who were suggesting that you embody the addictive voice in a fictitious entity. And this, this part's a little embarrassing, and I was not going to share this. This is just going to be a private journal that I kept. But I decided to call that inner voice of, of addiction, I decided to call that my pig. I decided that um, I was going to make very clear rules, like I'll only ever eat chocolate on a weekend again, and that any voice which suggested that I would have chocolate during the week, well, that was my pig. My pig wanted it. I didn't. Um, whatever it was saying, the specific thing it was saying was pig squeal. And when I heard it, I'd say, my pig wants that, I don't. I don't listen to pig squeal. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. And as ridiculous as that sounds for a sophisticated psychologist and you know, a person who's done all this consulting, and um, that's what worked for me. It, it, n- not immediately. It wasn't a miracle. It was not a miracle. But what did happen right away was I stopped feeling confused and powerless about the whole thing. I stopped feeling like, like there was some mysterious force inside me, like I just couldn't control it. And I started to recognize that I could make other choices if I wanted to. And I don't need pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. It would wake me up at the moment of impulse and give me those extra microseconds to make the right choice. Sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't. And I would, I would play with different types of rules over time. And um, then eventually I realized, well, there's no point in breaking my own rules. I'm, I'm making these rules myself. I can make any rule I want to. If I wanted to say I'm just going to eat donuts all day, I could do that. And so I made very practical rules that were very sustainable, not too restrictive at all, and then I could follow them. And then gradually I made the rules just a little more restrictive so that I could lose a little weight, um, and I did. And I did, and that's, that's what worked for me. That's why I'm a, that's why I'm a thin guy today. Um, I lost about 60 pounds and kept it off, and um, that was about – 10 years ago now, I guess. And then when I was, when I was getting divorced in 2015 and I had this journal, I was a minor part of a publishing company and the CEO called me and said, we need to write a book because we have to, we have to do some aggressive things with marketing and really prove that we know what we're doing so we can attract some other authors. And, and I said, well, I have this journal about this pig inside me. And he says, I love it. I have to see it. And I said, I don't know if I want to go be public and talk about this pig inside me. And he said, no, 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 you have to do it. And so he reads the journal, and he calls me back um, two weeks later and says, donuts are pig slop. I don't eat donuts. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. And he lost 86 pounds, and the rest is kind of history. We, we published it. Um, we both know what we're doing in marketing because we're, we're – you know, we both have a history in marketing as well as psychology, but um, – well, I have a history in marketing and psychology. He's a software developer. And, and we, um, it, it took off. We d- didn't expect it to take off the way it took off. And you know, now we have about 700,000 readers and 2,000 reviews. And it's, um, now people, they don't quite know my name, but sometimes they'll recognize me in a bookstore and they'll point at me and they'll go, pig guy, pig guy, pig guy, which is, not really what you want to happen on a first date, but um, that's my story. And thankfully, all these people are resonating with it, and I get notes every day that saving people's lives and um, came just at the right time because I had to close down everything else when I got divorced. So that's my story. Well, it's quite a story, and I think <clears throat> what our listeners should really pay attention to, uh, one key word that you had in there that you used was the word impulse. And, uh, you know, it's really important for people to understand when it comes to addiction, which binging to a degree could be considered an addiction. Is that true? Sure. Okay. Uh, And this could permeate it in areas like alcoholism, drug abuse, and nowadays it's binge television watching. To me, it really is all the same thing. And they can all be destructive depending on how much that you do of it. 
But when you said impulse, uh, I thought that would be an important place for people to really pay attention because first you have your mind that created the pattern that gave you the impulse to relieve whatever that anxiety is. As you had mentioned earlier uh, about the food industry, there's a huge level of anxiety that is created, not just in the food industry, but in advertising in general. You know, the anxiety of selling, for instance, sickness on television and magazines and radio newspapers that tell us you may have this mysterious whatever it is, here's the solution. The fact they've planted the idea of anxiety into you in the first place makes you reach out. Well, I don't have that, so I don't think I'm going to go after that drug. I've got control. However, I need to find a way to soothe myself. And a perfect example of that is any of us driving down the road to go anywhere, find ourselves hitting, for instance, that drive through coffee place for a mocha, or perhaps we want to drive through and get that burger, that chicken sandwich. It isn't really because you're hungry. It's because, think about it, driving creates anxiety. You're watching traffic lights. You could be in a hurry to get somewhere, uh, things like that. And so you use this, that impulse, to soothe the anxiety. And I think as people could come to understand that, first of all, that's the first point, I would say, to start with. And it sounds to me like, to a degree, that was the way you changed the way this could become effective when it comes to helping people to stop binging. Would that be true? Um, yeah, definitely. Definitely it is. And most people are not aware of the level of anxiety that's created in everyday life. I mean, when you're driving, no matter how good a driver you are, there's a chance that you could be killed, right? You're, you're making a left turn, someone could ram up behind you on, on the light. And I, I was in a bad car accident a long time ago because a drunk driver hit me. And, and you know, there's, there's always an element of um, excitation and threat that people experience when they're when they're driving, when they're fighting it out in the boardroom, when they're um, you know doing all sorts of everyday things in life. And one of the I remember an interesting study in graduate school, which showed the level of media t attention that was paid to the threats that we face as compared to how likely they actually were to happen. And so, for example, when when there's a case of botulism or a terrorist attack, there's an incredible amount of media attention and everybody is terrified that, oh my God, my plane is going to blow up. But the truth is that you are infinitely more likely to get hit by a car when you're crossing the street, right? And so as a consequence, we all walk around terrified of these very, very unlikely events and not nearly as afraid of <laughs> slipping and falling in the bathtub or getting hit by a car when you cross the street. Um, so there, there is a lot of anxiety in everyday life. And, and excess food does interfere with the nervous system's ability to conduct the emotions. That is definitely true. There's another piece of it, though. And if you think that you are only eating to soothe your anxiety, then you can get into trouble. See, the foods that we tend to binge on are things that we didn't evolve with. There, was no, there were no chocolate bars in the savannah. Um, we didn't have, you know, pizza and pretzels and all those other yummy foods when, or when we were evolving in the chocolate. Or <laughs> yeah. Hey, there's a snack bar down there in the uh, rainforest over there. What do we say we go get a Snickers, you know, kind of a thing. So. Right, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. And these artificial concentrations, these industrial concentrations of pleasure, which evolution didn't prepare us for, are very much akin to drugs. And what we're actually doing is getting high with food. And the reason I emphasize that over and, above, over and above comforting or soothing yourself is because if you think that you're only soothing yourself and your pig can say, oh, my God, we need comfort and just go get us some, you know, some bread or some bagels or whatever it is that's your particular comfort food. And I, I don't advocate any particular diet, by the way. I, I just help people to stick to what they want to. Um, if you think that, 
then you're leaving a big hole open for your pig to, say, feed me. You know, you, you can't be so cruel as to make me suffer with this anxiety. But if you recognize that you're actually getting high with food, most people don't want to think about themselves as a drug addict, and they'll start to think twice about what they're doing when they do it with food. So um, I like to point out the other piece of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, for instance, somebody who's feeling, let's say, sad, you know, perhaps there's a breakup, so I'm going to get up and I'm going to grab a quart of ice cream. And I think what's unique about that is how often you might see that in movies or television shows. Like somehow subtly they're giving you permission to go ahead and do that. That's okay, they're doing it, and look at how they're doing it, and they feel better now, so will you. But you don't recognize that's what's happening. Right. Right, and our whole society seems to have a tacit agreement to slowly kill ourselves with food. If, if you look at how things have evolved and what we're eating and how obese we've become, and that everybody seems to think that everything is okay in moderation, which for some people it is, um, you know, the, the, see, the, there, there are compromises we have to make, right? Uh, maybe in the ideal scenario, everybody would just be eating fruit and vegetables all the time. But you can't carry that many fruits and vegetables around with you to go to work and sit in an office and commute and all the things that you need to do to get through the day. And so we make compromises and then we justify it to each other because we have to, otherwise we couldn't function. But I I think that that process has gone too far these days. And um, and yes, everybody has been programmed to think that – you know, a cheesecake when you when you break up is a good idea. Um, and I would go so far as to say that sometimes your pig might say, ooh, let's break up with that guy so we can have cheesecake. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> you know, here's something I wanted to point out, too. And, uh, I'm on your website right now. It's never binge again. And since you, uh, a .com, that is never binge again .com, and you uh, bring up the pig, you uh, have in here in your blog the single most difficult squeal to recognize, what would that be? The single most difficult squeal to recognize is the idea that you've got your pig under control and therefore you can put it back in its cage whenever you want to so there's no harm in letting it out. And the the normal progression through this method usually involves Finding control, and the way you do that is you come up with one simple rule. Any simple rule that it's not necessarily something that's going to make you lose weight, but it's going to point the ship in the right direction. It's something that's going to make a difference, but it's not that burdensome to do. An example might be, you know, I always put my fork down between bites, or I never go back for seconds, or um, I never wa- I never eat while I'm watching TV, something like that. And when, when you do that, um, before you know it, you'll start to recognize all the th- things that your pig says to get you to break that rule. And you'll be able to have a new control that you haven't had before. And then having felt that control, you, you're going to hear the pig say, well, it's not so dangerous. You can just let me out for a little bit. We can eat while we watch TV tonight, right? Um, and the, you know, the solution to that is to recognize that it's silly to break your rules for any reason whatsoever. If you really want to go back to eating while you're watching TV, then just change the rule. Write down why you want to change it, specifically what you want to change it to. And wait 24 hours so you know you're not doing it impulsively, and then change the rule. So that's, that's the most difficult skill to recognize. Now, taking a look at this now, a lot of times when people try to make these changes, especially when you take a look at, for instance, the idea behind the 12-step program, Alcoholics Anonymous, is that we take one day at a time. Now, let's go ahead and talk about that for a little bit because sometimes that can be real challenging because what happens is we got our 30-day chip, we got our 60-day chip, we got our 120, you know, pretty soon you're two years and you're three years and you're four years sober, and you're counting these, but it could just take that one moment that you may just slip, and the kind of guilt and burden that carries that could actually take you down a rabbit hole in a worse position than you were when you started. 
Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, this philosophy is the polar opposite of the 12-step philosophy. One day at a time, it, um, it can work for a period of time because it says, well, we could, be, we could binge tomorrow if we want to, so I guess we can deal with not doing it today. And the entirety of the 12-step philosophy is cultivating fear and dependency. Um, I need to have a sponsor because I'm like a dependent little child and I can't, I can't be trusted on my own. Um, I, I don't know if I'm going to binge to, to, I don't know if I'm going to binge tomorrow, but for today, I, today I choose not to. And it, it leaves a dark cloud hanging over the individual that despite all of the troubles that the addiction has caused them, that they might go back to it tomorrow. Um, this is very different. Now, the similarity is that it can be helpful to focus on the present moment if you're struggling. So if your pig says, you know, I, I, you're going to forget eventually and then you'll binge or um, you've always screwed up in the past so you're going to screw up in the future, you can bring it back to the present moment and say, well, I just choose not to binge now. But the way that it's different is we say, that the future is an infinite string of nows, and I'll always be able to choose not to binge now, and therefore, I will never binge again. And you can cultivate confidence instead. Um, I do think, I do think that the counting of days and time, and using that that for public adulation, where you walk in. I, I was in twelve-step programs for many years, so I, I, I'm talking about this from personal experience. Um, I can see that you're definitely doing that. That's why I thought I'd bring this up. Yeah. Not that I knew you did, but, you know, again, that's, you know, alcoholism is binging, which means specifically you're doing more than ordinary on a regular basis. Would that be the right way to define it, or is there a better definition you can give our listeners? Um, you know, I like to tell people, I mean, you can look up the DSM-5 definition of binge eating, um, which involves feeling disgusted with yourself more often than not after you eat more than you want to and, um, and having, you know, I think it's five episodes per month. But rather than getting really focused on do I have this problem or not, just ask yourself, as far as my methodology is concerned, um, could you use more control? Would you do sometimes you find yourself eating beyond your best judgment and would you like to have more control? And you don't, you don't have to be sick to use this. You don't have to have a serious problem to use this. It can just be like, you know, I wish I didn't have a second plate of ice cream. And, and this is a very practical pop psychology thing you can do to not have that second plate of ice cream. I'm, I'm not going to tell you you have to go to meetings. I'm not going to tell you you have to take medication. Um, this is just a self-help thing that you can do all on your own. So, um, yeah. The, the other thing I would say is that it's very odd to be seeking public, public adulation for not doing something antisocial um, for a period of time. I mean, could you imagine standing up in a meeting and saying, I haven't robbed a bank in 17 days now. Yay for me. Right? You know, right. What, what, <laughs> Or, you know, here's the other thing, too, because we've briefly brought up the idea of the 12-step program, and uh, there's, there's a wonderful show out there that kind of people can actually see this, and it's a show called Mom, and it's a, you know, a show about a mother and a daughter who are, you know, decided they don't want to be addicted anymore, and so they go to their AA meetings, and then they try to cope with life and all the things that come with being sober. And what you see is two things. <clears throat> A, the first thing is they say who they are in these meetings, and then they say, you know, I'm a, an alcoholic addict, okay? So there's the shame right in the beginning, you know, that I just couldn't manage my life, and so I have to let everybody know that. But now I am managing my life, and everybody's cheering for you. And this goes on day after day after day, and it's like, that's kind of like a push-me-pull-you situation, isn't it? <laughs> what, what, why do you have to rub your nose in SHIT? <laughs> right. Every... You know, and then celebrate me after the, that I've got over the shame to have the courage to share with why I'm here in the first place. And, and, and I wonder, because I know I believe uh, one of the things that you talk about is constructing, you know, a, a way of looking at uh, – 
so you know a, a way to look at yourself successfully rather than focusing on the problem so much. Would that be the right way to put that? Yeah. Um, it turns out that when you make a mistake, when you make an eating mistake, most people are very familiar with the intense self-criticism they feel and self self-hate and self-judgment and that negative race that goes rampant and, you know, pounds the gavel after you do that. Well, it turns out that that's your pig and that it's, it's motivated to make you feel too weak to resist the next, next binge. And so all of that gathering evidence of failure, and, and which most of us allow because we think that it's going to stop us from binging again. We think if we suffer enough, it's going to stop us from doing it again. But the truth is it makes it more likely we're going to binge again because it makes us feel too weak to resist the next one. And it turns out that if you gather evidence of failure after your mistakes, then you're going to build a failure identity and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But if you gather evidence of success after you make a mistake, then you build a success identity. And so what that looks like is, uh, did I have five cupcakes instead of 15? Maybe I had the whole pizza, but I didn't eat the box. I'm just kidding about that part. Um, maybe I stopped the binge after an hour instead of five days. Whatever it is. And if you, maybe I had a salad in, in there with the binge at some point. Gather evidence of success, and you will start to focus on those successes and be more likely to repeat them, and you build a success identity. So um, I always tell people to gather that evidence of success. I also tell them to commit with perfection, but forgive themselves with dignity. It's very important you forgive yourself if you made a mistake, but that doesn't mean that when you set out towards the goal, you say, well, I'll just do the best I can. Um, when an Olympic archer is aiming at the bullseye, they know exactly where the bullseye is. They can see the arrow going into the bullseye in their mind. They can feel that they almost become one with the bullseye, and they have a perfect commitment to hit the bullseye. They're not thinking, maybe I will and maybe I won't. The Olympic archer is the bullseye, and then if they happen to miss it, they analyze in what direction did they miss, um, by how much did they miss, what do they need to adjust, maybe they didn't account for the wind resistance, maybe they need to change the stance a little bit, and then they get up and commit with perfection again. They, they don't, after they miss the bullseye, they don't shoot, up, shoot all the rest of the arrows up into the air and say, screw it, I'm a pathetic archer. Or, you know, if you accidentally touch a hot stove, you're not supposed to put your hand down on the stove and say, your whole hand down and say, oh, I'm a pathetic um, hot stove patcher. I might as well just burn my whole hand. You know, you, 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 we make mistakes. It's, it's part of the process, but we still can commit with perfection. So, and then gather, gather evidence of success. And the way our neurological systems are set up, if you keep getting up and aiming at the bullseye, you're going to get better. The reason that people don't is that there's all this confusion in our culture. There's all these things pulling us away from the bullseye. And people don't understand this really critical insight that that negative voice is there to make you binge more, not less. So did I answer your question? Well, it certainly does. And I just wanted people to kind of get an idea. First of all, I think when we decide to make a choice, for instance, I want to stop binging because obviously my health, I just don't feel as good as I would like to. And they get to that moment, like, for instance, with Thanksgiving coming up, you see this table just arranged with all this food. And Thanksgiving is one of those that turned into sort of that joke out there that says, how much can we eat so we can sit on the couch, you know, with our hands down below the belt buckle enjoying a football game as we go into a coma. <laughs> you know? yeah. and, and it seems to be like that's the goal of Thanksgiving. Now, myself... I enjoy going to buffets, but it's not because I can get all I can eat. It's not because I can go back for thirds, fourths, and fifths. It's because there's that opportunity that I could try a wide variety of foods, and I never go on overstuff myself. I just enjoy doing that, you know. And the thing is, though, it's amazing because sometimes I wonder, like, there's certain times you might go there. And this is just kind of a way to look at binging also because everybody is going to be 
different or their reasons for binging will be different. It's not a one-size-fits-all, but for instance, like there'll be a night where they're serving king crab legs. Now, how often do you actually go out and buy king crab legs? Most people would say those things are expensive, but for the price of 30 bucks to go into a buffet on king crab night, you would see some of the most astonishing things with people piling as many of these things on their plate as they can without spilling them on the way to the table. And you have to ask yourself, well, is their binging a result because they're just starving for king crab legs or is it something different? You know, becoming aware of what causes you to binge, much as you talked about that can of syrup in the bottom of the refrigerator that your mother used to give you when you were about the age of one. You know, getting to sort of like what Bruce Lee would call the source or the cause of his ignorance. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, in the situation you're describing, I, I think that um, it's the scarcity that's driving that binge. It's really an external force. We, we tend to crave things that we think might not be available at another time. Um, if, if it's a scarce opportunity, we tend to crave them independent of how much we really want that particular thing. And everybody in sales knows that, you know, there are only 10 left, uh, only till Saturday. Um, <laughs> exactly. It's a once a year event. So mm-hmm. what, what I tell a lot of my clients on Thanksgiving, a lot of people, a lot of people, they have their regular rules for everyday life. And then a lot of clients, um, they, on Thanksgiving, they have one plate of food of anything they want. And then they have one dessert and they feel proud of that. And, the, the most important thing is to make the decision beforehand. If you, if you walk into an environment, this goes for restaurants also, if you walk into a food seductive environment, not having made your decisions, you're, you're going to be relying on willpower. And willpower is very much related to decision making, and it's fatigued by every decision you have to make. And so, you know, if you walk into an environment where there are 40 decisions that are going to impinge upon your senses, you know, do I, do I have this or that and how much and when do I have it and when do I stop? And if, if you walk in there and you have to make all those decisions at the moment, you're, you're likely going to fail. But if you think it through beforehand and write down exactly what you're going to do um, and, and enjoy it, then when you get there, then I find that people are often successful doing that. Now, I wonder, too, as uh, we just probably have about five minutes left, is uh, how often do you help people work with the feeling of their impulse? In other words, there's the thought, there's the impulse. Kind of feel that for a bit before you actually reach out and make that choice. Well, overeating beyond your best judgment has to do with an activation of the survival response in the lower brain. Um, usually overeaters or over dieters also, they tend to be good dieters. And they've set up a pattern in their brain which says that they periodically go through periods of, I'm using this word very loosely, famine. And if your brain thinks it goes through periods of famine, then when food is available, it's going to think that it has to feast. Um, this, is, this is all a lower brain response. It's an activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. And what you want to do in order to take yourself out of that is to breathe. You could tense up all your muscles as you breathe in and then breathe it all out and just sit with it for a little bit and then do that again. You can also carry a piece of paper around with you and write down specifically what you want to, what, what the impulse is for, what, what you think you really want to have at that time, without any requirement that you do anything about it. Because writing is an upper brain function and um, binging is a lower brain function. And you we'll have different feelings. You'll have, you know, different labels for the emotions that you feel at those times. But, but basically you are in an activated state, your body's perceiving an emergency and you want to take it out of that perceived state of emergency. Then you want to ask yourself, are you really hungry for something? Do you have an authentic bodily need? 
because um, just white knuckling it and starving yourself is not going to work in the long run either. Right? <laughs> no, then you'll really be pumping the gas down the throat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it was funny because something just occurred to me as you were describing that, too, is the idea that as we're driving and you feel like you want to pull into the fast food place for a quick snack, is that you say, well, am I really hungry at this moment? Well, let's go ahead and see if we can get to the next drive through and pass this one and see what happens. And then pretty soon as you kind of sit with that and soothe yourself, self-soothing, you'll realize you know, I really wasn't that hungry in the first place. <laughs> and I feel much better because usually after you eat something like that, most of the time you kind of feel tired, you know, worn out, whatever the case is. It, it makes it worse, not better. Yeah, 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 definitely. You know, it's an amazing topic, and I'm sure a lot of people uh, are really eye open uh, with your particular kind of work. You know, when you talk about binging, you know, it's not something that's easy to deal with, but it's something that people can deal with, and they can be very successful at it, can't they? Yes, it's it's easier than you think. It's, it it feels like it's impossible, and it feels like it's something you've been struggling with for all these years. But it's it's not as hard as you think it is. It's the it's really the first hundred hours after you give something up that that you're going to miss it the most. Um, you, you could be a hundred hours from freedom. So. Yeah, I, I'd love to give people a free copy of the book if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. I was just going to uh, suggest, you know, where's the website? You know, we were talking about it earlier. I was looking on your blog there, but uh, tell people where they can find out more about your work. It's so on neverbingeagain.com. And just quickly, big red button for the reader bonuses, and we'll get you a free copy of the book in Kindle, Nook, or PDF format. I also create a set of food plan starter templates for just about any diet. Um, you know, macrobiotic, ketogenic, um, point counting, calorie counting, what, whatever you do, there's a starter template for you. And because this sounds really weird in the abstract, you know, what, why is there this, this psychologist on who has a pig inside of him? Um, I, I recorded a bunch of coaching sessions, and those are free too, just so you can hear what it's actually like in practice. It's, it's a very compassionate program. It makes people feel better about themselves, not worse. Some people are afraid you're going to be calling yourself a pig, but it's not, it's not really like that. So um, neverbingeagain.com, click the big red button. And last but not least, would you uh, say that it would be fair to say to the listeners out there, be forgiving of yourself. You know, just, uh, just you know, take it as you can, and, and, and there you go. You, you have to be, be kind to yourself. You would never talk to a friend or a child, the way that you talk to yourself after a mistake. So try, try to keep that in mind and treat yourself the same way. Very good. Glenn, thank you so much for joining us on the program today to share your work with the world out there, and uh, I'm sure it will certainly make a lot of people feel a lot better about binging and that they can actually have more control over that than they believe they do. Absolutely can, yeah. Thanks for having me on. You bet. It's been a pleasure. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for joining us. You can discover more at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter to keep up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as our upcoming shows. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway. <laughs>